In this video, I will introduce the topic of substantive review of administrative decisions. So far in the module, we have been concerned with procedural judicial review. So a good starting point is to explain, using a couple of examples, just how substantive judicial review differs from procedural judicial review. In a way, the clue is in the name. But just to make sure we are all on the same page, I will say that in substantive judicial review, we are not concerned with whether an administrative tribunal or agency or other administrative body has followed fair procedures. Rather, we are concerned with whether they have erred in substance. Let me start with a couple of examples of where the substance of a decision was challenged in judicial review. For now, we are not concerned with what the court decided. We will get to that in good time. I just want to start by illustrating the sort of questions that substantive judicial review throws up. My first example comes from PESM versus British Columbia Superintendent of Brokers, a 1994 case. The issue that presented itself in that case was whether PESM and others had made a timely disclosure of certain transactions as required by the British Columbia Securities Act. The BC Securities Commission had found that a timely disclosure had not been made, and as a result PESM had been suspended from the Vancouver Stock Exchange for one year and ordered to pay costs. So what was at stake was a question of law, or perhaps even we might say a mixed question of fact and law, but we won't get into that complexity just now. The question that arose was concerned with what was and was not a timely disclosure in terms of British Columbia securities law. The statute only allowed penalties to be imposed for breach of the securities law, and so if the Commission had gotten the law wrong, in terms of the interpretation of sta the statute, as PESM had argued, then there was no justification for the application of the penalty. So PESM's grievance was not that it had been treated in a manner that was procedurally unfair. It was that the BC Securities Commission had made a substantive error in interpreting the statute under which it acted. My second example is Halifax Regional Municipality, versus Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission from 2012. That case concerned the decision of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission to establish a board of inquiry into a complaint under Nova Scotia's Human Rights Act. Now, unlike in PESM, the Nova Scotia statute did not prescribe by law a set of rules setting out when a complaint should or should not be referred to a board of inquiry. On the contrary, the statute conferred a discretionary power on the Human Rights Commission. If the Commission had tried to exercise a power the statute had not given it, then this would have been a question of law, just as in PESIM. But accepting the Supreme Court of Canada's judgment that it had not not done so, the question arises as to whether and in what circumstances a court could intervene to set aside the discretionary decision of the Human Rights Commission. So when we are talking about substantive review, we are talking about one of two situations. The first situation that we saw in PESM is where the question is one of interpretation of law. And the second situation is where the question is not one of law, but whether the administrative body is exercising its discretionary powers in a way that is appropriate. The crucial question is, of course, the test that the courts apply in answering these questions. In Canadian administrative law, this is question is couched in terms of what is called the standard of review. That is, in deciding whether an administrative agency's interpretation of the law can be overturned or its exercise of discretion reviewed, we must first ask, what is the standard that the reviewing court should apply? Now, as you may know from reading the case of Baker, Canadian law used to treat these two types of situations quite differently. But Baker marked a turning point because it said that the standard of review analysis should be the same in each case. 
As Madam Justice Leroux Dubay put it at paragraph 54 of Baker, it is, however, inaccurate to speak of a rigid dichotomy of discretionary or non-discretionary decisions. Most administrative decisions involve the exercise of implicit discretion in relation to many aspects of decision-making. To give just one example, decision-makers may have considerable discretion as to the remedies they order. In addition, there is no easy distinction to be made between interpretation and the exercising of discretion. Interpreting legal rules involves considerable discretion to clarify, fill in gaps and make choices among various options. In other words, there is no hard and fast boundary between rules and discretion. No clearly defined hole in the donut, to use a metaphor that was once used to clarify the relationship between rules and discretion. What there is, to extend that metaphor, is variation in the density of the dough. Making sense of statutory rules involves the exercise of discretion. Equally, deciding how discretion should be exercised involves a consideration of the purpose of the statute, as we saw in our introductory lectures when we considered the English case of Padfield. Now, before I get to what the tests are, I want to talk a bit about how we got here. In fact, the last half century of the development of administrative law could be understood as a search for workable standards that would provide effective guidance as to when the courts can intervene to correct what they see as the errors of administrative bodies. And as we will see, this is a journey that may not yet be over. Finding workable standards to guide the courts in substantive review has proved far from easy, and it seems that at every stage the tests developed by the courts have shown as many pitfalls as they have advantages. That may turn out to be as true for the approach set out in the 2019 case of Vavilov as it was for earlier approaches. Historically, the approach of the courts to questions of law and review of discretion have been very different. The position in relation to questions of law, except where the statute contained a privative or preclusive clause, has been to give the decision on the correct interpretation of law to the reviewing court. This is similar to the position in English law. As Lord Diplock put it in the GCHQ case, Council for Civil Service Unions and Minister for the Civil Service, whether the decision maker has or has not correctly understood the law that regulates his decision making power and has given effect to it, is par excellence a justiciable question to be decided in the event of a dispute by those persons, the judges, by whom the judicial power of the state is exercisable. This contrasted with the approach traditionally taken to the review of discretion. English law, and historically Canadian law too, has taken the approach that, provided the decision maker did not exceed the boundaries of his discretion, the court can only intervene again quoting Lord Diplock in GCHQ, if a decision is so outrageous in its defiance of logic or accepted moral standards that no sensible person who has applied his mind to the question to be decided could have arrived at it. This is known as the Wednesbury Standard after the 1948 case of Association of Provincial Picture Houses and Wednesbury Corporation. The Wednesbury Standard emphasises that it is the perspective of the administrative body rather than the reviewing court that matters. Only if the primary decision maker's perspective is so unreasonable as to be irrational can the court intervene. Now, I will leave the issue of review of discretion to one side until later in the module and talk about review for what was traditionally called errors of law. And one question we can ask is, why should we prefer the interpretation of the reviewing court over that of the administrative decision maker in the first place? And this was indeed a question that the Canadian courts began to ask from the end of the 1970s onwards, 
As they did so, they increasingly doubted what I have called the traditional position, which is also the position of English law. Now, what I have called the English approach is in some sense natural from the point of view of how the common law approaches things. With respect to questions of law within the court system, a hierarchy operates in which the lower courts follow the appellate courts, with the Supreme Court of Canada operating at the apex of the court system, propagating its view of the law downwards. So if we characterise administrative bodies supervised the courts as inferior tribunals, as they are often called in older case law, and we might think that they should be subject to the interpretation of law given by courts that are higher up in terms of the court hierarchy. We can call this the question of relative expertise. But it is not just because of their greater expertise that Parliament, or as the case may be, a provincial legislature, might want to have that body interpret the relevant law. Another reason can be seen by looking at labour legislation. The approach of the Parliament of Canada and various provincial legislatures is evidence of frustration with the approach of the traditional courts in the field of labour relations. Historically, labour legislation has been interpreted through a common law lens of freedom and privity of contract, the protection of property and the sort of restraint of trade. And as a result, it has been somewhat hostile to the collective bargaining approach which underpins much legislation. The legislative purpose in setting up a parallel administrative regime of labour relations boards has been, if we are honest about it, to take this class of dispute out of the courts and give them to bodies which are committed rather than hostile to the objectives of legislation. And in an attempt to ensure that this objective has been met, the legislatures have sometimes attached a preclusive, or in the Canadian terminology, a privative clause to such legislation. We will go into more detail in the next video about what these clauses exactly involve. But for now, think of a privative clause as a clause giving to the administrative body alone the power to decide disputes arising under the legislation and which attempts also to prevent the courts from exercising judicial review. We came across an example of a preclusive clause in one of the pre-recorded lectures for week one, when we considered the case of Anna's Minnick and Foreign Compensation Commission. So expertise and the legislative desire to see disputes heard by a body that is committed to the objectives of the legislation are two fairly pragmatic reasons why we might want the voice of the administrative body rather than the voice of the courts to be the dominant one in the interpretation of the law. There is another reason which is a little more philosophical, and that goes to the question of whether there really is one right answer to questions of the interpretation of administrative statutes. The idea that there is one right answer arguably underpins the traditional common law way of doing things, in which the superior courts have the final say and other courts or inferior bodies follow that lead. But is the one right answer assumption justified? We could answer this question in general jurisprudential terms, but now we are interested in the more concrete terms, in the kind of statutes that delegate powers to administrative agencies. Borrowing a phrase from Justice Dixon from the case of QP that I am about to come to, administrative law statutes bristle with ambiguities. And this relates to the context of dynamic administration that I talked about in my lecture on the administrative state. And in the general overall process of making sense of the statute, the way in which one set of ambiguities are resolved has knock-on effects in terms of other aspects of the interpretation of the statute. Courts and jurists have come to use the term polycentricity to describe the way in which one set of choices has knock-on effects for others and vice versa. Just like tugging at one thread of a spider's web deforms the whole thing. The idea of polycentricity 
comes from a classic article by the American jurist Lon Fuller called The Forms and Limits of Adjudication. He thought polycentric disputes were not readily resolvable by judicial processes, although it should be added that he didn't necessarily think the sort of tripartite processes that are commonly used in labour disputes necessarily were much better. So for all these reasons, it may well be, depending on the circumstances, that the usual assumption that the courts, and in particular the appellate courts, are best placed to give an authoritative interpretation of the law is not justified. But where do we go once we have decided to move away from the Diplockian position that questions of law are par excellence questions to be decided by the judges? This is a question with which Canadian judges have been wrestling for 40 years. And it is a battle in which two weighty constitutional principles often appear to fall on different sides. On the one hand, the idea of the rule of law suggests any exercise of administrative power should always be subject to the review by the general courts. On the other hand, the sovereignty of Parliament requires us to respect that if their legislature has expressed its judgment that a matter should be determined by an administrative body other than a court. If that is the case, then the expression of legislative intent should be given effect to, so the principle requires. And so the courts have sought to steer a balance, and at various points in recent history, they have tried to recalibrate that balance, most recently in the case of Vavilov that I mentioned above. This is a process that I think has not reached its finishing point. So, having started this video with a kind of conceptual overview of some of the issues in relation to the standard of review applicable to substantive review of administrative action, I will finish this lecture by taking you through what in many ways might be regarded as, as the foundational case in terms of the modern approach to substantive review. A word of warning though, the case I am about to talk about, Tupi versus New Brunswick Labour Corporation, is no more than a staging post in the development of the modern law. So it is an important case to understand but it is in crucial respects no longer reliable as a statement of the modern law. We will see this in more detail in the next video when I get to talking about Dunsmuir and Vavilov. The significance of QP is that it marks the point at which the Supreme Court of Canada took the decision to depart from the traditional approach. QP was a labour relations case. And the outcome of the case turned on the interpretation to be given to section 102, subsection 3 of New Brunswick's Public Service Labour Relations Act. The section said that during the continuance of the strike, the employer shall not replace the striking employees or fill their position with any other employee. And no employee shall picket, parade, or in any manner demonstrate in or near any place of business of the employee. The objective of this provision was to ensure the resolution of industrial disputes through a process of collective bargaining. It sought to provide confidence in a collective bargaining approach by preventing employers from replacing striking employees, in return for which employees had to refrain from picketing their workplaces. In other words, so that neither side would use compulsion to impose their views on the outcome of the dispute. In the dispute with which the case was concerned, both sides allegedly breached this provision. Employees were picketing the workplace on the one hand, but on the other hand, New Brunswick Labour Corporation were having striking employees' work carried out, not by other employees as such, but by members of management. So the case raised a question of law, and that was, did the section prevent positions being filled by managers? The New Brunswick Public Service Relations Board held that it did, and accordingly upheld complaints both against strikers and the employer, the New Brunswick Lake Liquor Corporation. 
and the corporation objected to this and sought judicial review. This was successful at first instance, but the union appealed and eventually the case came before the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court found for the union, but the interesting thing from our purposes is not who won and not even which interpretation of the law was the correct one, because the court avoided that question but rather the basis on which the court decided the case. Section 102 was protected from judicial review by a privative clause, and traditionally the court would have approached the issue as a question of jurisdiction, as the House of Lords had done in the English case of Annis Minnick. This would have been a formalist approach to recall the distinction between formalist and substantive rationality from week one and would have yielded a binary choice. If the interpretation of the law was in jurisdiction, the courts would not interfere. But if it was out with jurisdiction, the privative clause would have been disregarded by the courts completely. But in QP, Justice Dixon, giving the judgment of the court, approached the question through much more substantive, goal-oriented reasoning. Privative clauses, he argued, have a straightforward and compelling rationale, which he explained. The Labour Board is a specialised tribunal which administers a comprehensive statute regulating labour relations. In the administration of that regime, a board is called upon not only to find facts and decide questions of law, but also to exercise its understanding of the body of jurisprudence that has developed around the collective bargaining system as understood in Canada and its labour relations sense acquired from accumulated experience in the area. In other words, having matters decided by a specialised tribunal had such benefits in terms of speed and finality, expertise in the practical aspects of labour relations, and although Justice Dixon is speaking very politely, he is also making an implicit contrast between the board's understanding of the jurisprudence around collective bargaining and the more individualistic approach of the common law courts in the area of employment law. As for the interpretation of section 102, Justice Dixon found that the statutory wording was capable of reasonably supporting more than one interpretation. The fact that the Court of Appeal was divided on the question underscored the fact that different interpretations were sustainable. Of Justice of Appeal, Justice Limerick's judgment in the court, he said, This appears to be a reasonable interpretation on first reading, but with all due respect, no more or less reasonable than the interpretation which found favour with the board. This did not mean that the court could not, under any circumstances, reject the interpretation of section 102 given by the board. But it could only do so if the board's interpretation was, in Justice Dixon's phrase, so patently unreasonable that its construction cannot be rationally supported by the relevant legislation. So QP stands for the proposition that where a statutory provision is hedged with a privative clause, the courts will approach the issue not through the lens of jurisdiction, but applying a standard of patent unreasonableness. In some other situations, and we will discuss later what these are exactly, the courts will continue to apply a correctness standard. That is, the reviewing court will impose its interpretation of the statute on the administrative agency. I am not now attempting to spell out in detail when this will be the case. Rather, I am flagging this up for, so that we will get to it later. And in fact, it is no longer the case that the reviewing court will apply a standard of patent unreasonableness in situations like these. The law has moved on, and the standard is now just called reasonableness, as we will see. But the important point is that in QP, the court had taken the first and most significant step away from a formalist approach to questions of jurisdiction. The case signalled the beginning of an era that would be characterised by what has become known as deference to the decision given by administrative bodies on questions of law.
This did not mean that the reviewing court had to accept the interpretation of the administrative body, as I have seen, but it should approach the review of the decision through a consideration of the agencies of approach, rather than starting from its own assumptions. As defined by Professor David Dysonhouse, deference as respect requires not submission, but a respectful attention to the reasons offered, or which could be offered in support of a decision. As we shall see, the decision in Vavilov gives further direction as to how reasonableness review should be conducted, but we will leave the details of that for another time. In the meantime, I hope you have enjoyed this video and that it has opened your minds to some of the questions that we will be considering in, in later videos. In many ways, I have only scratched the surface of the issues arising in relation to substantive judicial review. In particular, you should note that I have only really talked about the question of what the standard of review should be. I have not touched on the equally thorny question on how to apply the standard, once we agree that it, what it is in a particular occasion. In my next video, I will be looking at privative clauses in more detail, and in my final video for this week, I'll look at rights of appeal given by statute. These topics are related because they both involve instructions from the legislature about the kind of scrutiny that the courts should apply. But as we shall see, the approach the courts have now adopted takes a very different approach in each case. We'll get to that, and I'll see you in the next video.